Good morning, everyone. We are so excited to be here, and we are very honored to kick off the many interesting papers that will be presented over the next two days. Before we get started, we want to give a big shout out to the organizers of the third annual Culture Symposium. We know how much hard work and probably sleepless nights went into this, so thank you. My name is Marika Brower-Berg. I'm an archaeologist and an assistant professor at the University of Vermont. Along with Dr. Eleanor Harrison Buck of the University of New Hampshire, we are the co-directors of the Belize River East Archaeology or BREA project. And I'm Tawny Tibbetts. I'm a geoarchaeologist and I'm at the University of Iowa. To start off the session on ancient Maya technologies, we're going to talk about granite groundstone tools and how they were moved across the landscape of the Maya lowlands. Before plastics and metal, ancient societies turned to stone, wood, bone, and other durable materials to make household tools and implements. Like many others, the ancient Maya created stone tools for crushing and pulverizing. Some of the things they crushed were edible, such as maize kernels, beans, cacao, chiles, seeds, squash, and tomatoes. And some of the things they crushed were inedible, like lime for plaster, minerals for paints, pigments, grit, shell, limestone, and even broken pottery to add as a binder for clay. Both modern and ancient Maya households use a variety of grinding stones for different purposes. There were cups and pestles, mortars and mullers, grinding slabs and lap stones, as well as pallets for pigments and flat surfaces for laundering, pounding, and husking. Perhaps the most recognizable form of grinding stone in Mesoamerica is the mono and matate set. Here you can see in the top right-hand corner, uh, the matate, which is the base stone on which materials are ground, sometimes flat on the bottom, sometimes with feet to elevate them. Um, and then you also see the mono, which is the handheld portion that is moved across the matate to grind. Many people here today probably have examples of these types of grinding tools in their homes or know of people who do, maybe your parents, grandparents, neighbors. Of course, modern technology has made most of these tools obsolete, but there are still those who value their utility. And, you know, when the power goes out, as it does, the mono and matate still work. Monos and matates themselves were found in nearly every household unit among the ancient Maya. These ground stone tools were time consuming to make and required a lot of knowledge and skill to produce. The people who make ground stone tools are often referred to as metateros. And in the past, this was a trade that was passed down through generations of male relatives. To shape coarse grain rock like granite, in which the rock crystals can be seen with the naked eye, metateros must hammer and peck and grind these rocks into the desired shapes. You can see some examples of metateros at work on this slide, roughing out monoforms and matates, finishing grinding surfaces and shaping foot supports. When we look at collections of groundstone tools from the Maya lowlands, which today spans the Guatemala Peten, Belize, and Northern Honduras, a handful of raw materials were commonly used, including basalt, rhyolite, quartzite, limestone, and granite, which we're going to focus on in a bit. As can be seen in Christina Halperin's map here, both Belizean granite and quartzite were used outside the modern boundaries of the country, although Belizean granite was most commonly used at sites in proximity to the sources in the upper Belize Valley. This map indicates that it was not uncommon for people to transport groundstone tools long distances between the quarrying source and the location where the tools were ultimately discarded in the past. Granite is the most durable rock that occurs naturally in Belize. This makes it a very good raw material for producing grinding tools, since they're likely to have longer use lives. Tools made from granite have been shown in experimental work to have lower amounts of grit that can get into the flour or food products that are being produced. There are only three sources of granite in Belize. They're what we might call geographically restricted. Granite only occurs in these places, Mountain Pine Ridge, Hummingbird Ridge, and Coxcomb Basin, all in dark gray. All of them are very similar in their physical and mineralogical properties. Our own research at the Brea sites, shown here in the black outline, has shown that granite was the preferred raw material of groundstone tools outside of the upper Belize uh, Valley, at distances far from the three sources of granites available from the Maya Mountains. For communities located further away from these sources, these heavy tools had to be hauled long distances, which was no easy task. So we ask why? What is so special about these granite groundstone tools? There was plenty of limestone around in the Brea study area, but people did not use it for their grinding tools. 
archaeologists tend to look at groundstone tools in terms of what they are made of and how that relates to either production and exchange or to food preparation. Some rocks are more efficient grinders, some rocks are locally available. There's not a lot of discussion among archaeologists about the role of manos and metates within the household and the deeper meanings these tools may hold to a person or to a family. It is very likely that people were making personal choices when it came to their preferences for ground stones. So we're going looking for answers. What we've been looking at in our work is multifaceted. First, where did these tools come from? We've had success in sourcing granite tools recovered from archaeological contexts to their original location within the Mayan mountains. But our second question for this talk is, how? How are these tools moved? What did the energetics of their movement entail? And by what routes were they moved? By water, overland, or a combination? This leads us to the why. Why were these tools being moved, in some cases over 60 kilometers away? These tools are heavy. Some matates can approach 50 pounds. Were they being moved because granite was the best grinding material available? Were they moved because they were aesthetically valuable or possibly because they were culturally or religiously important? Or were, were these movements driven simply by economic functions? To explore these questions, we first looked at the physical distribution of granite. To answer that question, we looked at a study of uh, X-ray fluorescence, which you can see here, where this instrument allows us to generate a unique chemical signature of a particular rock. It's like having a fingerprint or the genetic code for a rock, which allows us to investigate who the rock is in terms of the three families of source granites found in Belize. This is helpful because it allows us to narrow down where the granite tool comes from. We compared the chemical signatures of ancient tools with modern day granite samples and uh, that we tested from each of the three granitic sources. We then matched the groundstone tools to the sources in Hummingbird Ridge, Mountain Pine Ridge, or the Coxcomb Basin within the Maya Mountains of Belize. We learned from the XRF testing that almost all of the granite groundstone tools found in the Brea study area come from the Mountain Pine Ridge source. Now this was surprising to us because the Mountain Pine Ridge or MPR here source is not the closest as the crow flies. That would be the Hummingbird Ridge or the HBR. Additionally, when you look at a topographic map of Belize, you can see that traveling from the Mountain Pine Ridge source to Chow Heesh or the archeological site of Saturday Creek, it's not a there are lots of difficult uh, types of terrains and ecosystems to move through. So this led us to our second research question, which was how? How were these tools moved from their source, where they were quarried, to the place where they were eventually discarded? To explore this, we looked to the ethnographic record for indications of how such heavy loads were transported. There were, of course, no pack animals in Mesoamerica prior to European contact, so goods had to be moved by people or the technologies developed by people. Undoubtedly, for heavy loads like groundstone tools, there are two probable methods of conveyance. The first is the use of tump lines, straps that were attached to either side of a heavy load and then balanced on the hairline of the carrier, thus using the spine to bear the brunt of the load rather than the shoulders, like a backpack does. People in descendant Maya communities have long used tump lines or mechapals to transport materials. Interestingly, ethnoarchaeological research has shown that individuals or pairs of individuals using tump lines could feasibly transport heavy loads of upwards of 100 pounds, albeit with quite a lot of training. The other probable, me probable method used by the ancient Maya to transport heavy loads like groundstone would have been the dugout canoe. Of course, Everyone in Belize knows how important water transportation is and was with the annual Route to Maya Canoe River Challenge, tracing the original mode of conveyance between San Ignacio and Belize City that was a critical conduit into the 1900s. An ancient example of a dugout canoe has recently been found in the Yucatan near Chichen Itza. And here in Belize, an ancient paddle was found by Dr. Heather McKillop in Toledo District, along with a small replica of a canoe. So knowing that tump lines and canoes were likely modes of transport, we set out to explore the potential routes by which the groundstone tools were moved. We began with what we did know, which was that we'd found 77 pieces of granite groundstone tools and fragments in the Brea study area over the last 10 years. 
Each of the triangles here represents the vicinity in which we found granite groundstone tools, either on the surface or through excavation. We also know the location of a granite mono workshop from the area around Pac Patoon in the upper Belize Valley. So we undertook some geospatial exploration in a mapping software called ArcGIS to determine the path of least resistance from, from uh, a mountain pine ridge source to some of the Brea archaeological sites where granite with a matching signature was found. We mapped two different scenarios, an overland route, which assumes that tump lines were the primary mode of conveyance, and you see that here on the left, and an overwater route, assuming that dugout canoes were critical. The overland map is overly simplistic and cuts straight lines across the landscape that, you know, perhaps an AI driven drone could follow, but certainly not a human moving through diverse ecosystems and across major riverways. By contrast, the overwater map returns further distances to travel. However, if one made use of the downstream current and had a dugout canoe or raft, they could, in theory, transport more groundstone tools for less effort overall. Now, these maps are intended as exploratory heuristic devices, but they are helping us to understand the possible routes, time, and labor costs involved in moving quantities of heavy groundstone tools from point A to point B. And our third and most difficult question to answer is why? What factors drove the movement of these tools? Was it strictly economic and transactional? One person needed a new matate, and so they ordered one, and it was delivered by a metatero to their doorstep? Or did this person visit a regional market where a metatero was hawking their goods? Or did they walk to a workshop or quarry near the source and haul the tool back home with them from there? These are the questions that the archaeological record is not yet able to satisfactorily answer, although the ethnographic record does hold some clues about market-based distribution and direct trade models. For example, the metatero here is depicted bringing his finished products to a market to sell to end buyers and distributors. So in the time remaining, we'd like to go beyond the sort of transactional explanations to explore the more relational aspects of groundstone tools and their movement. We draw upon uh, observations of the Kekchi, Quiche, and Pocoman Maya groups living today in Guatemala for ethnographic parallels to our case study. Among these groups, there is gender complementarity in groundstone tool production and use, meaning that while men are responsible for groundstone tool production and distribution, the bulk of the tool's use life revolves around female-oriented tasks, like grinding maize. As soon as a grinding stone is used by a woman, it accrues a number of gendered restrictions regarding usage. These taboos prevent male contact with working grinding stones, reflecting some of the relational aspects of these objects that are power filled to their users. It is also notable that in these contemporary Maya societies, women play a role in the acquisition and movement of groundstone via the gifting of these items from an older female relative to a bride upon her wedding. The ancient Maya practiced patrilocality, the post-marital residence pattern in which a bride moves to the groom's residence following marriage. Given what we know about the gifting of groundstones between female generations, especially a wedding, we might speculate that the movement of groundstone was the result of intermarriage between couples from diverse parts of the Belize River Valley. Not only could marriage result in the movement of female-centered goods, but we imagine it might also have been a mechanism by which new trends, ideas, and practices were also circulated. While there are still many questions left to answer within our work on groundstone tool manufacture and consumption in Belize, we have made some headway on unraveling this story. New technology like XRF is making in-field sourcing studies possible. Combining geospatial data with geochemical data and looking to ethnographic analogy for frames of reference is allowing us to pr probe our data more deeply and develop more nuanced interpretations of these multivalent tools and the social connections they cemented within ancient Maya society. We've been able to pretty convincingly begin to answer the where and the how questions. The why is much more complex. It is likely there's no single answer to how and why the Maya were moving these granite tools. As we see around us today, everyone has a unique path through life. It's more than likely that some tools were purchased from merchants and others were given as heirloom gifts from one generation to the next. As many generations of Maya women pass groundstone tools down to their daughters, nieces, and other close family, many generations of Maya men moved the knowledge down generations and these skills to produce the essential tools of daily life. 
Today, we have the responsibility not only to conserve those surviving objects, but also we must continue to study them so that we can impart the significance on these, of these tools onto new generations. So we'd like to once again thank the organizers of the Culture Symposium, as well as the Institute of Archaeology of Belize. We are grateful to the very many Belizeans who have helped us in various capacities in our research, both in the middle reaches of the Belize River watershed around Banana Bank and in the vicinity of Crooked Tree, Biscayne, Gardenia, and Santel villages. We thank the Elfwood Foundation, EPSCOR Nebraska, and the National Science Foundation for their financial support of this project, in addition to our home institutions, the University of Iowa, the University of New Hampshire, and the University of Vermont. Thank you.